Alrighty, uh, good morning YouTube. Um, this is A Zero here back with an another uh quick movie review. Um, and yes, before you go off in the comment section, if any smart ass wants to say that it is the morning currently where I'm at, it's like three o'clock, possibly three thirty right now. But anyway, um, this is one of my favorite movies uh with Tupac in, it, and it's actually a lot of people's favorite movie. Um, the other one I liked he did was gang related. But um, technically, this was his first, you know, solo movie. He actually appeared in another one before this, but he was credited as Digital Underground. It was some movie that Dan Aykroyd had did. I can't remember. I think it was like an, an anthology film or something like that. But this was Juice uh, starring uh, Tupac, Omar Epps, and part of me, but I forgot. The other two guys, his names, they're even on the screen. Um, the one that plays uh Steel and um uh Raheem. Yeah, who play Raheem, uh Queen Latifah and uh Samuel Jackson are like the other two big names I can think of that are also in this. Donald Fajon has a uh cameo and um Flex Alexander does. Um and uh this movie's directed by a uh, uh a first time director, a known black um director. He also did a few of the Walking Dead episodes as well. And of course, um his other notable credit was uh Tales from the Crypt, Demon's Night. I am talking about Ernest Dickerson, of course. And um pretty much this movie is um pretty much like a funny meme that I saw. It pretty much said uh, you know, this movie ha had really taught you know, a lot of people, regardless of how tight you guys are from day one, they can still turn against you. And that's pretty much what, what this movie is. But uh, the term juice, I don't know that they even still use this term in New York, but it's really a, a, another term of respect. And um, and this movie is really showing the average life, you know, of, you know, four black teens living in New York. And um, to be honest, uh there are many ways of, of trying to get respect. And, you know, uh, what I liked about what Tupac in this movie, actually in most of his roles, if you notice, um, because he's a rapper, they don't always try to incorporate him, you know, doing music within this film, even though it's there with Omar Epps' character, who, you know, uh, Quincy, but... Yeah, uh, what I noticed about all of his films, it really wasn't a heavy music incorporated. Uh, it kind of a little bit was teased in Poetic Justice a little bit, you know, with his his cousin who was his character. But they never even even took it that far. It, it really hinted a lot if that's what he was going to do with, with his life, you know, playing the character of Lucky. But um, with this film, what I really, really liked, uh, it's pretty much straightforward. You know, it's about four friends trying to you know, is their daily life and, you know, they're pretty much a crew. They're not really a gang, you know, alluded to as, you know, what the police you know, might say. But, um, you know, uh, all four, you know, guys have, have, have a different life. And, you know, um, Quincy, you know, is the one that that's most likely, you know, to, to, to skyrocket and prosper pretty much, you know, um, it kind of reminded me of, you know, Dr. Dre when we when I started talking about when we eventually reviewed Straight Outta Compton. But you see, he had a lot of talent, you know, for music and whatnot. And it sucks because his mom was scolding him on it. And the shitty thing is that if only Quincy knew, you can actually go to school and do something either in sound engineering or, you know, music production, something like that. But, of course, it sounded like his mom, yeah, wasn't having it, you know. He just... And, and again, I'm going to allude to that a little bit. And now that I think about it, we'll get this straight out of Compton. But, you know, um, you know, uh, he also makes, you know, mixtapes. He DJs. He's more local, you know, around in his area of Harlem. And um, he really cares about his craft versus, you know, some of the other stuff the other dudes yeah, would do. You know, Bishop is the one who's the hothead that wanted, you know, to, to pretty much do crime. And um, even Tupac had, had stated this about his about his character, you know, he's really not a bad kid. He's just uh, a product, a bad product of, of his environment. 
and a misguided, you know, you know, kid, you know, he's looking up the, you know, Scarface and um, can't remember the name of that. I think his name was Cary Grant, one of the, in one of those gangster classic gangster films. And the sad part, he was a little bit right about, you know, living in New York or any neighborhood of you not being punked all the time. That's the one thing I do agree with. But at the same time, he I think it had turned him a little bit crazy. And, you know, seeing that with his father in the movie and it took me a while to even catch on that, you know, um, that's why his father, you know, was traumatized. If you see the beginning of the film, I thought he was in a war. Come to find out he was a, a human blow up doll in, in, in prison. And, and, you know, um, even Radamez, one of the, the, the gang members, the Puerto Rican gang members had even alluded to that. And, and it took me a minute because, you know, most of the shit talking, you know, was mainly on Bishop, you know, himself. And, uh, you know, it just pretty much sucks that, you know, um, the only way he saw of getting respect was, you know, doing crime. And like I said, it sucks because like when I do these other reviews of how, you know, people who who had these talents and they use that to get their respect and notoriety and it stays and it keeps them out of trouble. It's a different priority versus what some dudes want to do and directly fucking up their life. And just like what Tupac's character Bishop said, you know, I ain't shit. I ain't never going to be shit. And as soon as I think you a lesser man than me, pal, and there's really some crazy dudes out here. And a few of them I did had come across, but I never got that crazy like that because I was always to myself. But you can tell just by talking to them, they ain't right, you know, all all in the head upstairs. And um, Tupac, he did a very good job at being very, very threatening in this film and menacing, especially in the scene right after uh you know, he kills um, Raheem and he's playing like the innocent, you know, benevolent devil when he's hugging, you know, his sister, you know, and I'm like, man, this, this shit is cold and uncomfortable. And, you know, but that's how it usually is, you know, nine times out of 10, when crimes like that happen within their own crew, depending how, how deviant it is, somebody always knows. But, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, good stuff I've heard, you know, online. You you can even type it in, you know, um, type it in. Wow, that's how tired I am. Go on YouTube and look up the different stories, you know, of all the experiences of this film. Um, the one good thing and, and what I heard, you know, well, not really heard, but of course, the guy that played Steel has said it, you know, one of the best auditions he he had doing this movie and um a lot more films are doing it now i don't know how they were doing it prior to, to this one but he made the the ernest dickerson had made them all you know um well actually the outsiders did it even though i i don't know if i said it on there but ernest dickerson had had made them all you know hang out and live together and um really had that chemistry so you know it's believable when you see it on um on the on film and you know uh like I said the outsiders did it in another film Chronicle had did it too I remember Michael B Jordan had said that with his cast members yeah they lived in the house for like three weeks or I don't know if it was three weeks but it was a long extended period of time so they can get to know each other so when you see that bond it's authentic and again I don't know how many films even you know do that you know, movies, but to me, I believe it's very crucial, especially if, you know, the movies are revolving around, you know, two people. Now, when I get to Fast and the Furious, I'm not too sure if that's what, you know, um, Paul Walker and um, Ben Diesel had did, you know, because in the later movies, you really see them have a brotherhood. And of course, a lot of people know outside off the camera they did. But back to this, um, this was one of one of those, uh, those crime movies, or you can even say that, um, that really had the, the perspective of, of black people and, you know, dealing with the police and just interaction. You know, I'm kind of curious if there's any white counterpart, you know, film noir to, to, to this movie. Uh, the one I could definitely think of with Asians is, uh, Better Luck Tomorrow, but 
that's an independent film, and I also reviewed that one too. And it's it's really different with the crime they had did because it was based off of off of a real crime. But um, it's just funny how, like I said, with the Boys in the Hood uh, review, um, how Hollywood has a different perspective because you know um, the scene that really loses to me is uh, you know when um, all three of them were in there after that murder about what happened and then you know despite you know Quincy didn't know something about it the real main truth most of the time especially today is what he said you know the cops asking why he's so nervous I'm like think about it we three niggas sitting up in here and in a police station you'll find us guilty of something and that that part is, is definitely true you know especially you know, like I said today Nine times out of ten, when the police stop or pull you over for, for something and they can't get you on it or you know how to negotiate yeah, with it or it's some bullshit thing they're accusing you of, then they try to cover it up and get you for something else. Pretty much what I like to call a cover up for they fuck up. So, you know, and I'm I'm really tired of, of that shit, you know. And I've talked about recently how I had a certain moment like that one in. You know, again, we can go in the comment box and talk about it if you want to know about that. But, um, yeah, uh, it's just showing the, the the real reality. And at the same time, from Quincy's perspective, he can't be, yeah, he can't trust one of his best friends. And at the same time, he can't go to, to the police either because even though he ain't pulled the trigger, they, you know, they even that they did the whole investigation, they still going to put him in jail for something. But um, one of the uh, them other realities, um, there was an alternate uh, scene in this movie, which was the ending. I bet you there are a few other ones, like deleted scenes if you get the special edition. But in the movie, um, in the ending, where uh, Q was holding on to, um, to, to Bishop and, uh, you know, um, and he slips out of his hands and, and he falls in the original ending. Bishop, they hear the, the police and then he looks at Q and he says, I'm not going to jail. And then that's when he lets go and falls. And to be honest, um, I really wish they had kept that in there. That's like a real reality moment. And I hate when they cut or alter, or alter scenes like that. Um, Get Out had, had did the same thing with their ending. And it was funny because I remember sitting in the theater seeing, you know, the ending, the uh, when you thought it was actually the, the police from Get Out. And it was right then when they cut and it was the real police that had showed up. And I really wish, you know, Jordan Peele had kept that in there because it, it even though it was in horror and fantasy a little bit, it just showed a, a nasty, scary reality that he's more safer in prison than he is being out there knowing that, you know, these what these white people were doing, you know, moving consciousness into black bodies. Yeah, so, you know, it's kind of funny how I even stated before multiple times, I hate it when they cut scenes out of movies, nine times out of 10, they do it because the, it wouldn't necessarily flow right or they want to hurry up and get to the next scene. But in this one, in this scenario, you, you know, they wanted a, a a certain ending where they didn't want, you know, Bishop to be, you know, sympathetic because at that moment he had to pay for all the, all the shit he did, which I do agree with, but like you should have known of the whole consequence um on it and um possibly the, the another uh scene or situation I want to talk about um or well, we're not really seen mm, that's how tired I am again um what I also liked about this movie and some of the older films as well um the outsiders did it and I think um Poetic Justice and um, Higher Learning did it, but they had this really cool thing where um, where they shoot, they have two characters on a on screen and sometimes one character's in a background and it looks like it's from another shot. Like it's someone, it's like a collage on, on, on the screen if you follow what I'm saying. Um, I don't think I mentioned it in The Outsiders, but they, I heard... Francis Ford Coppola talk about it behind the scenes and I can tell Ernest Dickerson has saw the same thing and had used in one of the shots and one in particular was um when Q was standing waiting to when he was meeting up with Bishop in that final confrontation and the way Bishop came out 
you can pretty much say he was in the background, but the way it, it looked, it looked like it was from another scene completely or another shot and they just cut it and put it and blended it in. Yeah. All together into one frame, you know, and I really like how, you know, some of those older movies uh, did that, especially in the nineties. Like I said, the outsiders did it and Singleton had did in some of his films. I, um, I think, uh, of course, I said Poetic Justice had did it. Yeah, poet. I remember Poetic Justice did it in the beginning with Q-Tip. And when the game member thought he had saw him. And you can tell it was definitely one of those shots. Because, you know, they, they in the previous shot before, he was standing at, at the at the arcade. And then when Q-Tip was talking, you, you could see a cut in him points. And y'all recognize the, the dude. And, um... Higher Learning had did it a few times, and it was it's just a cool, unique, technical thing I just wanted to, to talk about because I really don't see that in film anymore, where it gives that optical illusion. You know, I really believe horror, you know, films should definitely utilize that. It's, well, our current horror film movies, I know some of the ones from the past probably did. But um, another cool thing um, about this uh Omar Epps and Pac and a lot of them were really friends on this movie. And it was funny. Um, the guy that played Raheem, I think he was the only one that didn't have any acting experience. Um, and he was the oldest one out of everybody. I think the youngest one was the guy that played Steel. But of course, you know, Pac had went to, you know, Juilliard. And of course, Omar Epps had acting credibility. And um, the guy that played Steel, he was in Lean On Me. So that was a kind of unique thing because now he was, I recognize him in, in, in a few films, you know, Bones is probably the other one they, that the guy that played, uh, uh, Raheem, I noticed him, you know, from, um, and another good, you know, behind the scenes, uh, you know, aesthetic, um, the producers had definitely understood, you know, with Ernest Dickerson, of course, um, Tupac, you know, with the whole racism, um, I think, uh, on a radio show, the guy that played Steel had even talked about it. It was him and the producers that had got into a cab at the time in like New York. And they probably even still do this today. You know, I heard Uber kind of does it, but how they racially discriminate against, you know, um, black males. And, you know, um, it's kind of funny how, how it is New York, but I, I heard like Uber does it too. And, when Pac is just going off and going off and talking about it, the good thing, the, the producers, I definitely understood it realized some of the content that was going to be in the film um, and the relatability, you know, of the whole thing. Um, and also um, behind the scenes, you know, Pac apparently was writing a lot. Um, I know that Brenda has got a baby. Uh, Omar Epps hadn't had knew about it too. And, of course, they didn't catch on until that album and that song came out. And the good thing, I don't think Omar had really, you know, Joan Pockley yet like that. But he knew when he heard the song, it was based off that article that, you know, Pac had told him of how he read about it in the New York Post. And again, when I get to All Eyes on Me and, and you know, Tupac Resurrection, I'm going to talk about, you know, that that story, you know, how controversial lyrics are at the same time a lot of truth you know with doing hip-hop and music and even if you see these movies it's the same thing it, it paints a reality that a lot of folks really don't know about even you know some generation of black kids don't today and, and, and the thing is that I give credit to you know a little bit how naive they are because they don't have to think that way but at the same time don't brush over the whole naive being naive that it didn't exist either because personally with me I'm caught in, in the middle and there can be some more personal stories I'm going to tell you know in these reviews of how you know certain black people wear that with pride and there's some who, who who live in that time that don't because it was a bunch of bullshit yeah like who takes pride of being dehumanized in a certain way you know wearing it at yeah as a stripe or, or pretty much seeking for something to be mad about and um you know um most of this movie had weighed you know a lot on on you know Tupac and and 
his really real good acting credibility. I'm, like I said before, on Higher Learning, Michael Radport definitely has said when I seen him in that, I knew that, yeah, this dude can act. And, you know, the shitty thing is that right after this movie was made, you know, at one point he was trying to keep up that hard image of him being Bishop and it cost him, you know, the role of Sharif on Menace to Society, which I definitely would want to see Tupac in, you know, but, um, again, if you look up that interview, uh, that the dude did on the radio show, the one that the guy that played Steel again, he even said, you know, and he had, had did a prank with him one day and that's what had got him to calm down because I think what dude was saying, he almost got fired from this job, you know, at being passionate and whatnot. And the thing is, like what Big has said on Notorious, most people was, would even ask, you know, who is Tupac? And people would have 10 different, you know, answers, you know, every single time because people yeah, used to say you you didn't know what kind of Tupac yeah you would get that day. And again, I can relate to that. I used to be the same way. You know, um, the good thing I still kind of am, but I learn how to calm myself and take a step back and, of course, not be a product of my environment, you know, and also pick my battles. And that's just being, you know, mature. But again, um, that's pretty much all I have to say about Juice, you know, get more about, you know, Tupac and everything else and next later reviews, which I can't wait to do, you know, uh but anyway, um, that's all I have to say. Uh, peace.